Thanks very much, Andrew. And yeah, thanks all for coming out. Um, yeah, so just to talk a little bit more about how I, how I kind of came to be at Positive Money. As you said, I did a research degree in carbon capture and storage, where I start, started in 2008. It was quite an exciting place to be there um, because it was kind of like a technology for bridging the transition between fossil fuels and renewable energy. And there was a, a competition in the UK and we were going to have a kind of a carbon capture and storage project up and running by 2014. And I kind of imagined myself going to work on it. It was probably going to be in Scotland. Um, but obviously then the financial crisis really kind of sunk in and that environmental agenda seems just be getting shelved by the, by the government. Um, and yeah, I kind of started thinking more and more about the economic system. And in 2011, I was at a talk um, by Anne Pettifor, who's a kind of economist and uh, was one of the only ones to predict the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, she kind of said two things that kind of struck me. One was, you know, we can afford renewable energy. Um, and the other thing she said was, well, when the uh, Fed kind of bailed out the US banks, Ben Bernanke just typed some numbers uh, into a computer. And, and that kind of really struck me and made me think, OK, there's some serious misunderstandings going on or there's, uh, you know, there's something wrong with the fin financial system seriously. Um, so that kind of led me on a path uh, to look into economics. And it was actually my dad who sent me the link to Positive Money. Um, and yeah, I was really excited to join as the campaign manager. And uh, just to say a bit more, we're kind of a research and campaigning organisation set up by Ben in 2010. Spent the first few years kind of really researching the monetary system, uh, trying to, to kind of tell people how money's created without being told that you're mad. Um, and now we're kind of moving into a more campaigning uh, section of our, of our organisation um, as the debate is kind of expanding. So we ask questions like, in, uh, inequality, why is the gap between rich and poor getting bigger? Housing, why are prices too high for people to afford? And the environment, what's stopping us tackling climate change? We try and link the big issues to how the monetary system works. Um, so for all those problems, there's kind of an issue like money can solve them. Potentially, but how does the money system actually work? Who creates it? Um, so quite often, well, when I think of money, you kind of think of it as circulating. this everlasting money between households, businesses, banks and background in the economy. Um, you know, only kind of leaving when the banknotes get too old. But actually, there are kind of two types of money. So there is money that circulate in the economy, but there's also a kind of spendable IOU, which is created when someone takes out a loan, and then when they repay, the IOU is ripped up um, and disappears. And the everlasting money is kind of cash and coins, and that is uh, created by our Bank of England in, in uh, the UK. And the cash and coins that we use in Scotland are created by the Bank of England and transferred up here. But that actually only takes up 3% of all the money in, um, in circulation in the UK, all of the pound sterling. And the rest, the 97%, are those spendable IOUs that get created when a loan's made and then uh, destroyed when the IOUs returned. And those, that set 97% is created by um, the main banks we have. And we're quite a... Uh, unusual country in a way that we have a very, very undiverse banking sector, you know, controlled by kind of five big main banks. Um, and so that money that they create is in the form of electronic deposits in bank accounts. So the numbers you see um, on the flashing up on the ATM, uh, most of that money is created when banks make a loan um, and it's held electronically on banks' balance sheets. So we don't have a kind of money system that, where money circulates from households to businesses to banks. Um, and we don't have this model that's actually still taught in textbooks. Um, you know, savers deposit money in banks and banks lend to borrowers. That, that model doesn't work. Uh, money is created at the point in which somebody goes into a bank and takes out a loan. Um, 
And I like to think of that money, those spendable IOUs, as a, an easy way to kind of think of the electronic money, the spendable IOUs, is, as the, the bath water in the bath. And when the loan's uh, made, it's like the, the water coming in through the taps. And when their uh, loans are repaid, then it's like the water coming out of the plug hole. And obviously, it's quite tricky to get those two in balance. So usually what's happening is either the, the money's flooding out of the, of the taps or, as we saw after the financial crisis, actually, banks panic and stop lending. It's like the taps being switched off. But of course, people still have to repay uh, their loans. And so money is still kind of disappearing for the system and as the water kind of runs out the plug hole. And that's when you go into a recession or, or even a depression. In the US, um, when they had the Great Depression in the late 20s, um, actually the, the amount of money dis shrinked by a third, which is quite a huge amount, um, makes you know economy running smoothly very difficult. So just a quote, um, because it's such a good one, by um, Professor Galbraith, saying the process by which banks create money is so simple that the mind is repelled. OK, so how much have they created? Well, uh, in 1970, there was about £30 billion in both cash and coins. By 1980, the green line is cash, and the, um, the blue line is the electronic money, the loans that banks have created. Um, and it was about 100 billion. Does anyone want to guess what it was by 1990? <laughs> Not quite there yet. Half a trillion. <laughs> about 500 billion. Um, anyone want to guess by, no, uh, by 2000? So, yeah, it's, uh, it's still about 850 or 900 uh, billion. And then before the financial crisis, that's when we went past a trillion. So then it was about 200, uh, well, 2.2 trillion pounds of bank issued money. And then you can see the fraction of cash obviously getting smaller and smaller until it's about 3% as it is now. So quite a substantial amount of money um, in the economy. And obviously because it's all being issued when people take out a loan, then it all is um, backed by debt. So the amount of debt in the economy increases at the same amount. So we have a situation where um, basically we rent our currency from private banks because we take out loans um, from the banks and we have to repay them with interest. So that interest is really the rent that we pay the, the banking sector for having the privilege to create our, our national currency. Um, and actually that breaks down to quite a significant amount of money. So it's about 100 to 200 billion pounds that we pay them um, per year in rent, and that breaks down to about 2.4 to 4.8 thousand pounds per person, which is quite a significant amount of money, and obviously one of the reasons they are so profitable as an industry. Okay, so they get to create all of the money, but what happens to that money? You know, surely they do something useful. Who decides how to use it? Well, um, it's the same. Uh, banks that create it, they get to allocate it. And as I said, because we've got a really undiverse banking sector, there's actually just five big banks um, which get to create and allocate most of the money in the economy. And it's not, you know, the bank um, the person that you see when you go into your local branch that's really deciding whether to lend to you or not. It's some kind of complicated algorithms, um, or well, profit maximizing algorithms that say that. So it's a quite a concentrated um, amount of um, people that decide where it gets allocated. And um, quite a vast sum of money. So in the five years uh, going up to the crisis, 2002, 2007, they allocated <coughs> £2.9 trillion. Pounds um, into the UK economy. Okay, so where did it go? <laughs> well, it didn't go into particularly useful things uh, for society or us as individuals. 40% went into mortgage lending, um, which inflated a, a housing bubble, which I'll talk about a bit more later. 37% went into kind of financial markets. Um, so that's kind of almost 80% going into things that aren't really useful for um, most normal people. And only 13% went into business lending. What most people think you know, is the whole job of banks to do is to lend to business. It's actually only about 10% of what they do. And another 10% went into uh, credit cards, high-cost credit, personal loans. 
So they have a, a, a choice, you know, where to put the money. And obviously, they're always going to choose where is most profitable. So they don't lend to productive um, parts of the economy in anywhere near the way people kind of think they do. And it's around 10% of lending goes, is directed towards useful things. And the majority of it is towards what we'd call non-productive, so financial markets and speculation and mortgage lending. And so what, what happens is you kind of have consequences which aren't necessarily useful. House prices increase quite rapidly. You also have a situation where the banks get to decide where, um, you know, what they do with your money. Um, and in terms of, of speculating in markets, um, food uh, speculation has caused some attention because um, some campaigning groups such as World Development Movement has been highlighted, you know, they shouldn't be speculating on food prices, which can have really bad consequences from, for some of the poorest parts of the world. And, uh, you know, you can end up in a situation where, you know, you're depositing your money with, with Barclays and they're investing um, or using part of that money to invest in things like the tar sands in, in Canada, which is obviously un, uh, undesirable, but actually they have the legal control over, over the money when you deposit with a bank. And obviously all the time that they're um, creating this money, it's, it's causing households and um, businesses to go further into debt. Um, and so this is just a graph to show the kind of, between 1990 and 2008, um, household savings um, uh, as a percentage of, uh, hang on, personal debt going up, per, so personal debt as a percentage of GDP going up between 1990 and 2008 from about 60 to 100%. And at the same time, savings as a percentage of disposable income falling um, from about 10% to zero. So you can see that kind of on the whole, we've been getting more and more indebted in this boom. Um, and eventually the debt becomes too much um, and a financial crisis is kind of precipitated. And this is Adair Turner, who was the chairman of the FSA in 2012, saying uh, the financial crisis occurred because we failed to constrain the private financial systems, creation of private credit and money. So, so we have this system where if the banks aren't lending, like the financial crisis, then there's no money. And worse than that, money's actually disappearing, as I showed in the bathtub situation earlier. Um, people are still paying down their debts. Um, banks aren't lending. So the kind of money in circulation is shrinking in the economy. So you get headlines like this, where politicians are desperate to get banks lending again, because it's the only way to get new money into the economy. Um, and as I said, yep, yeah, the, the taps turn off and people are still repaying the debt. So, um, so the amount of money shrinks. And quite quickly, after a financial crisis, you get a lot of people unemployed. So you can just see the, um, the year along the bottom and around 2008 to nine, uh, a jump of a million people um, became unemployed. And obviously, you know, we live in a country where um, you, if you go unemployed, you have uh, social security. And so obviously the, uh, the the um, national, that's when the national debt jumped uh, a lot as well. That's the situation that we're in. So we have a system where if we want more money in the economy, then we have to take on more debt. But obviously, we want less debt, and so we have less money. And really, we'd like a system where you can have less debt with more money. Um, but that's not possible. So I could stop there and say that's basically what positive money are advocating, that we just want a system where you can have less debt and more money. But I'll talk for a little bit more about um, some of the kind of negative consequences of this system. So why is the gap between uh, rich and poor getting bigger? So we kind of have this myth that it's fine for lots of people at the top to have lots of money because it trickles down to the rest of us. But in reality, through systems like the monetary system, it's sucked up from all of us to um, the people with lots of wealth. And that's done through the money system with kind of interest that we pay to the banks. So this kind of just shows um, income groups in split into deciles, into tens, and the poorest 10% um, of people pay a disproportionately high amount, so 9.4% of their income, all of the red, is paid uh, to banks in interest whereas the wealthiest 10% have a disproportionately low amount, so only 1.4% of their income is, um, is paid to banks in the form of interest payments. 
So um, another way is that obviously businesses and households need the money to, um, to kind of keep the economy going. And so they all have to pay interest on that in the form of loan, when they take out loans to banks. So it transfers money from the real economy to the banking sector. Geographically, um, as I said, we've got a concentrated banking sector in the city of London. So from everywhere else in the country, money's kind of sucked in to there, again, in the form of interest payments. Um, and also, what you do with your money. So when we're all taking out lots of debt, wealthy people tend to take out debt to you know, leverage their assets and um, speculate on things like mortgages and, and buying more properties. Whereas if you're on a lower income, you tend to buy consumables, which will actually depreciate with, through time. So that's another factor to kind of increase this inequality that we've already got. Um, so I've talked a bit about housing already, but just to show you a graph, because everyone likes graphs. Um, so the purple line is house prices between 1991 and 2010, and that's showing the index relative to that. So you can see they increased by 300% up until the crisis in 2007. Um, and the other three lines are population growth, housing stock, and mortgage lending. So you have to guess which is which. <laughs> So which is the green line? I think that's next. Population. Yeah, very good. Population growth. Anyone guess the red line? Housing stock. Yeah, housing stock. Um, so the myth that, you know, it's a, it's a supply and demand issue. We just don't have enough houses. You know, it might be true on a geographical level, but on a national level, we have enough houses for the people. Um, and so one of the big drivers is the blue line, which is obviously mortgage lending. Um, which increased over 500% up to the um, financial crisis. It's really driving that bubble. It's, um, it's money being pumped into um, mortgages through, the, through those, that period of time. But interestingly, it's, it wasn't that um, owner occupiership increased. It's not like more people got to own their own houses. Actually, that went down throughout that time. It was mostly mortgages going to people who already owned homes, buying more homes, you know, buy to let getting on the, um, on the buy-to-let scheme. And all of that money being pumped into mortgages you know, had one big effect for people who were renting or, or had one mortgage, the house that they lived in, which was just to pump up house prices. So uh, in 96, the average house price was 51,000. It increased to 78 in 2004. Increased to 140,000 in 2004. Did I say what you And increased to two, in 2008 to 179,000. So a huge increase over that um, period of, you know, 12 years. Okay, so just moving on to democracy. So you have a situation where, you know, as we saw, the financial crisis made a lot of people unemployed, which increased the natu national debt um, because of their social security and welfare. And you have a situation where debt-based money system after a financial crisis and, and nations become heavily indebted, we consider d democracy as, as that kind of dwarfs the, uh, the discourse and there's not too many options for politicians to take. But also in terms of the actual money going into the economy. So in the five years leading up to the crisis, uh, the kind of the government spent 2.1 trillion and commercial banks lent 2.9 trillion. So a significant amount more, which suggests their kind of power to really shape the economy and, and how our, you know, what um, kind of industries we have in the economy and what we don't. And obviously, whilst uh, the 650 MPs who uh, decide where that 2.1 trillion goes, and most of it's already allocated to various departments, you know, it's a very small amount of people deciding where that 2.1 trillion goes and where it enters the economy, and whether it just gets stuck in mortgages and financial markets before it hits you know, anyone in the kind of real economy doing real work. So, could it be different? Well, we definitely think so, um, and we're not the only organisation. Um, you know, we want to see a money system where businesses and households and people that do you know, real work in the economy to keep things going don't have to take on more and more debt, um, go into further debt. We want to see um, a situation where you don't have to have a money 
uh, a money system that has to continuously grow because if it doesn't grow, it will collapse into a recession and a lot of businesses will, you know, go, um, will go bankrupt out of no fault of their own. And we want uh, a money system where money gets to the places we need, whether that's, you know, affordable housing or flood defences. That's in, in Dundee, I think. I'm not sure where it is, but somewhere in Scotland. And um, energy, you know, we need, we need new we need renewable energy. So we want to see a money system where we can get new money to the places we actually need for a healthy economy. So what does positive money do? Well, as I said, the first few years was really taken up with research. So uh, we did one book with the New Economics Foundation called Where Does Money Come From? And then this was the book that we did on our own. So Andrew Daxon and Ben Dyson wrote it and it's called Modernising Money. And it's also how the money system works now, but also half of it is how we propose things could be different. Um, I won't, you know, lie, it isn't, you know, it isn't the most exciting of reads, quite a few balance sheets in there, but it's quite a thorough thought through proposal of how things could be different that isn't, you know, totally out there. It could be done. Um, basically, what we propose are that um, we could have a situation where instead of going to a bank and depositing it and it being there, legally theirs and they can do what they like with it, you have a situation where you basically you have two types of accounts. You have a, cu a current account which will sit with a bank but it will, within that bank it will sit at the Bank of England um, and they won't be able to do anything with it, it will be safe, it will be money that they can't then speculate anywhere and so if there's any financial crisis that money won't have moved and you'll be able to extract it as and when. And then there'll be investment accounts where if you do want to take a little bit of risk but get some interest on your money, you can invest it, um, but you kind of realign risk and reward. So our proposal also suggests that banks won't be able to create money anymore. Actually, all new money will be sustainable, everlasting money that doesn't get destroyed when loans are repaid. And the way that will work, um, well, kind of with our bathtub analogy, it will be like putting the plug in and shifting who is contr in control of the taps. Um, so it will no longer be the banks that are creating money. They are going back to being kind of intermediaries between savers and uh, borrowers. And the decision of how much and what for gets a split because we're not, if you have both under the same um, control mechanism, then it's a conflict of interest. And in a similar way to the current um, Monetary Policy Committee sets interest <coughs> rates, you could have a money creation committee that looks at how much new money, if any, we need in the economy each month. And the government looks at how to spend it. And so that money will be created free from debt and spent in the public interest. Um, so is this a radical idea? Uh, well, maybe some people think, but it has happened before in the UK, um, one of the only kind of historical documented places. But in the 1800s or before then, uh, all over the UK, banks could create their own banknotes, and that led to quite an unstable um, money system where lots of financial crises happened. And uh, the government of the day decided that actually the Bank of England should take on the sole responsibility for issuing banknotes. So they passed a bill, the Peel Act, in 1844. It's never been updated to account for, obviously, the, the kind of evolution of money. And actually, there's been a, never been a debate in um, Parliament, really, since then, about money creation and who should create a national currency. So, I mean, Scotland, I can not mention the fact that you're going to have a referendum on Scottish independence. Um, and, you know, it's kind of doesn't really change things. We're advocating for money reform on a UK-wide scale. If you went in, if Scotland went independent, then we'd hope that people would advocate for um, money reform on a national scale in Scotland. And we've done a small um, report just to kind of lay out the five, like, well, five design flaws of the pound sterling and how it could be done differently if it was... Um, you know, if Scotland did go independent and you could set up your own central bank and issue your own national currency. Um, and tomorrow, 
uh, we're launching a petition, the um, Positive Money R, uh, to basically say that we want to have a national debate now about money creation. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we're launching that through our subscriber list. We've got about 25,000 people now who are supporting us online. And we're hoping that they're all going to sign it and share it and get a lot more people interested in this debate because we think it's a really important one. And to kind of follow that up, we are pushing for a backbench debate. So um, MPs who are on the backbenches can uh, create, well, can put forward their own debates. We've got a handful, uh, we're now up to 11 that are committed to kind of going to a backbench debate and talking about this issue of money creation and who should create our our nation's uh, currency. And so we'd love for you, if you're interested, to visit your MP, try and get them interested. Uh, I think come and talk to Andrew or Richard or Scott about um, maybe going as a team and to go and see your MP and see if you can get them interested. We're not asking them to have an opinion to say what the right proposal is or to agree with positive money, but we're saying, you know, we should have a national debate about who gets to create it because the same banks that caused the financial crisis are still, it's still the same system, you know, nothing's changed. Um, we've still got an affordable housing, we've still got, you know, the highest personal and household debt in history um, and they're getting to, you know, blow up another housing bubble. So, you know, we need a, we need a national debate. Um, so yeah, we're trying to get things going across the UK. So we've had about 150 meetups over the last year in 30 different cities. We're getting local groups to kind of meet up more regularly, like lots of quite a few meet up monthly. So it'd be great if a uh, local group formed here in Edinburgh. And also we are kind of spreading internationally. So we've now got about up to 20 sister organisations. So all volunteers, um, they're not as kind of as big as, or they haven't grown as, uh, as many supporters as we've got in the UK, but they're, they're starting, you know, they've got websites, they've got social media accounts, and they're raising the debate in all these countries across Europe um, and even further afield. So that's quite exciting, especially when, um, when, you know, smaller countries which don't have such vast bank lobbies can actually get to their politicians quite easily and get a debate going. So we're quite excited about places like Iceland where um, uh, there's even interest to do a feasibility study potentially into uh, money reform. Uh, so we kind of, we want to support them because although we want to grow the campaign in the UK, we are well aware that we have one of the two biggest banking lobbies in the world. So. Um, if we can see some other countries move first as well, that would be great. So that's about all from me, just to kind of leave it at that. It's not a law of nature that we have to have a debt-based money system. And thanks for coming. So I have uh, two questions. The first question is, uh, you divided the amount of money that banks uh, lend in four different categories, and the two first were non-productive, and the two last were productive, right? Did I understand right that? Yeah, I mean, so it was the, uh, the third one was for business loans in right. the UK, and then... So the question is, if that's the little money, if little of the money they lend is from productive stuff, why when they chat the, the tab, why do they not chat just the first part and not the second part? Or put in other words, um, what, what's the benefit of not lending to businesses in crisis time? And the second question is, why is it possible to change the uh, currency system in one country without changing it in all the others to make it possible because, I don't know, if Ireland, Iceland decides to start changing it, mm. but then how do they do it to, for example, buy foreign currency in that country? Yeah. Would that depreciate their money to, to yeah. yeah, an exorbitant value or something? So, should I answer that one before we go? Okay, so uh, first question on business, I mean, it's, so it's just really not in the bank's business model anymore to make small lo like small loans to businesses because they're so ginormous. Basically, you know, if you've got, um, think about, so there are kind of two things. First, the, the amount of the loan and then 
um, the kind of backup. So for, if you lend to a house, um, the average house price in London is now hitting half a million pounds. If the person then defaults on their loan, you've still got the house. Um, obviously, you don't that often make big, that big a business loans of half a million pounds. So you make lots of small loans. So kind of, it's a lot more kind of paperwork to do to make that many loans. But also with their limited liability, if a business goes bust, um, then there's not much for the, um, if they default on their loan, there's not much for the bank to take. So there might be some assets like some computers or something, but you know, there's, there's not much to back that up. So it's just more risky. And in, in many different ways, it's more risky. So that's why they're kind of incentivized both in that way and also in the kind of international banking standards way to lend to mortgages. Um, and then with the international one, yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, obviously, if, say, you know, a smaller country like Iceland went, did the money reform thing, there would obviously be a big reaction in the markets and, you know, bankers panic and say, oh, I'm not going to invest in that. I sign the company anymore, but it kind of depends, I guess, how dependent how the country is on flows of money coming in and out of their country in terms of the real economy. Um, and but there's no there's no practical reason why it couldn't happen and why the you know market shocks wouldn't calm down after a few you know after a period of time. But also there's the potential that it might be seen as you know once they got over the initial shock, they might actually realise it's quite a safe investment then because it's not going to have booms and busts as easily so it might even become an attractive country to invest in. One of the things that appealed to me about positive money was the democratisation and your idea about the or the idea about using a committee to yeah. decide how much money should be that I'm a wee bit uneasy about that yeah. on two grounds. One is that it sort of implies it's a technical matter but yeah. really it's a political one is it not? And the other thing is how would they be accountable to the public? Because what's to stop it just being captured by the kind of interest that we've seen capture the finance industry? Yeah. I mean, it's not a straightforward matter, and I don't say that you know we've not necessarily got it right. I think the issue is that you could say a lot of politicians are already a bit captured, so then giving them both the kind of power to create money and allocate it could be a conflict of interest. And because the public are so distrustful of politicians at the moment part of the way that we've made the reforms are to make them as politically acceptable in the current situation um, not saying that we're necessarily you know really bound to these specific reforms and we've kind of put a bit more democracy in place so at the moment the MPC the mon is really undemocratic and it's just appointed by the governor and obviously the, gov the governor of the Bank of England is just appointed by the Chancellor and we kind of say that it, there should be some kind of election where the MPs elect, a bit like they currently elect like the select committees. So at the moment, MPs elect who's on the committees based on who is knows more about the environment or knows more about housing or knows more about the treasury, like f economics. So we kind of say the MCC should be elected economists. But I think it, it is um, kind of a technical you have to have economists on there because you, if the stability thing, you don't want to be creating excess amounts of money um, or too little money that might make you go into inflation or deflation. So you do kind of have to have some people that are able to do the modelling and the kind of complicated stuff, I think. Point taken, but I trust economists even less than I trust yeah. 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 Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think I have two questions, if that's okay. So, yeah. um, so my first question is that we have one of the two um, banking lobbies, large, bank, large yeah. banking lobbies in the world in our country. Yeah. I just wonder what does a banking lobby look like? Does yeah. it so it's just because um, our banking sector is so big and has so much money, they just have vast amounts of resources to put into like stopping any legislation going through so like a good example is at the moment or with the banking reform bill we're trying to get um, like transparency so basically data released that shows what sectors banks are lending to on a postcode scale across the UK so whether they're lending to businesses or mortgages or whatever and that's you know that's just transparency and they were, you know, really fought hard against it. And what they have is just resource to pour into paying lawyers and paying advisors how to stop any reform going through. Um, 
And yeah, so whereas civil society generally don't have any resources, so if they want to kind of push something through, then getting MPs time, getting legal advice about a bill is just a lot more difficult. So it's that just unequal, unequal kind of distribution of resources to go into kind of making laws happen. Yeah. Is the second one, would that be Wall Street, I'm guessing? Yeah, okay, exactly. Yeah. So and it's just really weird. I mean, I don't, I mean, Brussels is pretty big as well in terms of like stopping any kind of um, EU reform on banks getting through as well. So, I d you know, I don't know what the sizes are, but I'm pretty sure London and Wall Street are the biggest ones, kind of. So my second, second question, um, I don't, I'm not even sure I know how to ask the question, but I just, you know, you have, in this country, we have the city of London, which is an independent jurisdiction, yeah. which is not under Westminster's yeah. control. When most of the banks are. I'm sorry, it's a huge question. I don't yeah. even necessarily know the question I'm asking. I'm just trying to, how do you manage effectively an independent state where most of the money is being created yeah. inside our country and then trying to democratise money inside of that? Yeah. Ah. Sorry, no, no. I don't even, you know. So yeah, the city of London is a corporation in itself, which is really weird. And I don't know enough about it, but... I mean, it's kind of two things. It's like political parties, if they had, if they weren't, you know, scared, they do still think the banking sector is like our best industry. They are still under that kind of dream. So they're really scared of doing things, basically, anything. I don't feel like yet the City of London Corporation is even scared of them making decisions against the banking sector. But obviously, if they were, that could come up and they could... I don't know what, what powers they have, but one of the powers is this thing called a remembrancer, or, and it's a man that stands, or it could be a woman, I guess, that stands behind the Speaker of the House in the House mm. of Commons and can like whisper things to him behind her. Mm. It's really weird. Yeah. There was a film called UK Gold that um, was about tax avoidance mostly, but it kind of uncovered this idea, and there's been a few petitions going around about let's get rid of this person that has special powers in the House of Commons. Mm. Um, so these things are surfacing, um, but I think at the moment we're still at the stage where we need politicians to wake up and realise they need to clamp, you know, they need to have some political will before the kind of power of these, of what the banks do have sh is really kind of shown for what it is. The city of London is so powerful, it's like the Vatican in Rome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, different thing, but it's very similar. You can't go against it. Yeah. I mean, I stood as a paper candidate in the recent council elections, and we, I mean, I was not going to get elected, I was just there to be on the sheet. And um, so, you know, we got all got brochures sent to us from the City of London Corporation, you know, already before you even got no chance of being elected as a councillor in London, but they're kind of already trying to sweeten you or something. It's very scary. Question at the back. Yeah, I've heard some people say that uh, the reason that politicians focus so much on, on economic growth is also uh, a consequence of the way money works. What is your view on that? Um, so, not necessarily. So, yeah. So, so, I mean, the situation we have is we've got a debt based money system. So, if we stop creating money, then the amount of money <coughs> shrinks. Um, and so you kind of are either growing or collapsing. So they are desperate to have growth. But then, um, you know, GDP is only you know, increasing at 2% a year, which you could look as being quite stable. But then if you look at money being pumped into housing, it's much bigger than that. So there's an argument to say that if all new money was went into something that would create new goods and services, which would increase GDP, then it wouldn't, then we'd kind of have alarm bells ringing a lot earlier than we did, if that makes sense. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, we can't get away from growth when we've got a debt-based currency, because if you stop creating it, you just collapse in a way. Right. On your um, map of housing, businesses, and so on, yeah. that, that you showed how um, the debt loan the money, creative money is allocated. Yeah. It didn't really talk very much about the funds which are then gambled on the stock exchanges and, and on commodities and so mm -hmm. on. So I, I understood that one thing that's changed in the last few decades is, is, is this um, 
Um, the money, you, you focused a lot on housing. I totally understand that, and, and, and there's the leaflet on um, how um, the, 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 the mortgage side of things is very significant. But c can you talk a little bit more about the role of, of these secondary and tertiary yeah. um, things in, 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 the, in, the bank, in, in the financial system where there's gambling, basically? Yeah. I mean, and, 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 and where does that lie? Because I thought that was what a lot of the creative money was, was being used for. Yeah, I mean, it's like I put it up as almost as big as um, the amount going into mortgage lending, like 37% into financial, into the financial uh, markets. But I mean, they're kind of a black hole to me in a way. They're, you know, trading these weird mathematical algorithms that some poor PhD students have come up with. Um, but it, yeah, it's a black hole, but I think the key is money gets created by banks lending into some kind of less dodgy financial instrument, and then it just goes into a kind of the, the markets, the stock markets, and gets stuck there. And it, you know, it doesn't trickle down into the, the real economy, as we're, we're told. But it is a horrendously complicated system and completely unproductive. I mean, there's a really good argument to scrap the whole thing, right? <laughs> scrap the stock markets, I think. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, it's not something that we at Positive Money have spent a lot of time looking into exactly the pathways of money that's created as loans going in and where it ends up and that kind of thing. And then I suppose I slightly take issue with the, the, the image of the house and, and the and, and just saying and, and asserting that shelter is unproductive because it's a quite an awkward yeah. thing. In, in the human psyche, shelter I, I, is a you know, nearly human right. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that, but it, what isn't is, is, the, is, is the, the value added, the artificial value added. So it's the, it's the bubble yeah. which is unproductive. Yeah. It's not the actual. So I, I'm, have you ever had comments like that before about? How it's not, it's not housing. Hmm? You know, so it's not the construction of houses and building buildings is the problem. It's the fact that it, because there isn't, because the way the money is used with mortgages, if too much money goes into mortgages, the price of the houses just goes up and up and up. Yes. You don't build more houses. That's the problem. So it's, the asset, it's just inflating it as an asset. But mm -hmm. that's the problem. Sure. And it's not like it's getting more, that's why I talked about that owner occupier thing, because it's not like it's getting more people to own their houses. It's is actually just increasing the people that own the multiple homes. If you look at the statistics from the ONS, it's the owner occupiership went down in the period up to the boom. It was people yeah. buying multiple homes and obviously they're controlling rent. There's like, you know, rent controls is another area which is pretty outrageous. So yeah, it's mortgages, it's not house building that we're trying to kind of highlight. The non-productive part just relates yeah. to the fact yeah, that you're not putting money into new housing, yeah, exactly. but into existing yeah. housing. Yes, yes, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. It's, new, I think it's, it's new money, it's 40% of newly yeah, created money, so it's not, yeah, so. It's where it starts off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right, sorry, the next question was you, sir. Uh, okay. if, if you, if I, I just wanted to refresh you with the, um, What's the debate in the House of Commons? What, what the, the debate was that for? So it's, it's not been tabled yet, but it's a backbench debate that we're trying to make happen. And it's going to be on um, money creation, something along the lines of who should create our nation's currency, um, or should our nation's currency be created in the public interest? And it's we've got kind of three, um, <coughs> kind of Michael Meach from the Labour Party, Steve Baker from the Conservatives, and Caroline Lucas from the Greens, who have kind of agreed to lead it to try and get cross-party support and we've got 11 so far so if we can get any more MPs signed up then it's more likely to get tabled sooner and have a longer time to debate. <laughs> um, just a quick one, um, um, did, uh, have you contacted all the MPs about, about your philosophy and did you, just generally did you get any kind of response? From um, not all because all of them because um, we've contacted the ones that have had some kind of contact with um, with what we're doing either through signing an early day motion on money creation or being on the Treasury Select Committee. Um, I think 
you know, at first, so in March, the Bank of England came out with a paper about money creation and they kind of, you know, back to what we were saying, which is that money creation isn't constrained in a way. It always, is all created by banks when they lend. And that's really helped to kind of move the debate forward. And now we've got, we've had the chief economist of the Financial Times say basically advocating a similar proposal to us. And those two things in short space of time has meant that actually we're, it's becoming a bit more mainstream. So now we're going back to the politicians and they're actually listening to us a bit more because they can see the debate's not going away. It's just gathering steam, which is really exciting because if we, you know, contacting them a year ago, they just were kind of very dismissive. And, and so basically we're trying to mobilise supporters to talk to their MP because an MP's first... A priority is her, his or her constituents. So it's much better coming from the constituents than com coming from us because yeah, we're quite yeah, small yeah, and, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So Ben Stewart, then. All right, hi, I'm Ben. Uh, I come from, I guess, a pretty similar background for years. I just did a master's in ecological economics here at the University of Edinburgh. And so that's also how I came into this. Um, the topic, I was mostly concerned with growth actually yeah. and uh, solving climate crisis, yeah. solving pollution, solving all these things. Um, although there is a, a, a section on the website on the environment, um, it's, not, it's not exactly a, a, a big part of your promotion material. I can imagine that right now, you know, to, to gather um, to gather a lot of interest, you know, focus on, on the on the acute crises yeah. right now, even though, you know, you could, you could really argue that the environmental crisis yeah. is pretty acute as well, with the uh, news coming about the Antarctic ice sheet, the western half, just uh, being completely lost, basically. Yeah. Um, is that, uh, I, it felt to me, when I, when I, I mean, I came across Positive Money probably two years ago, when I was back in the Netherlands, or from, uh, but a lot of my friends here in the environmental movements, and like I, I work in an international development consultancy just south of Edinburgh, and they're all doing environmental management. And none of them have heard of this issue, and it's it's. I feel like there's so much we could gain if you could get environmentalists behind this as well. Um, Definitely, I mean, that's something I'm really passionate about doing. Sorry, had you finished there? No, I'm yeah. finished, yeah. yeah. Just, uh, um, and I've thought about it a lot. And I guess, um, th like, the main reason is, is the kind of way we've, Positive Money's already start, always started from is the kind of research-based advocacy stuff. So the kind of how the monetary system works and how we're performed is based on a lot of research. And basically it's a lot simpler to exactly correlate or have kind of cause and effect relationship between things like the housing bubbles and the monetary system. And the, the environmental um, stuff's just much harder and the growth stuff. So Tim Jackson, who wrote Prosperity Without Growth, he's, um, it's been really exciting that he read Modernising Money and he was like, oh, this really helped me fit this piece in. And now he's doing research a bit more on that connection between the monetary system and environmental stuff mm -hmm. and Andrew Jackson our head of our main research has gone to do a PhD with him and kind of on this stuff but you know a few of uh, other friends that are also from environmental backgrounds and uh, interested in this have gone I know someone that went to a PhD and was like yeah I'm going to just totally come up with the link between the environment and the munch system that's really clear and she was like switched her topic to housing after like and the, the mortgage bubble after like six months because it's just really complicated so I think yeah I don't think we've got clear arguments that are succinct that we can kind of put out there without knowing that we could probably be shut down a bit so it's kind of figuring out how to talk to people without Basically, we need, we need better arguments. Still. Yes. Sounds yes. like a topic to develop in the pub. Yeah. Um, for, for, for our next, uh, uh, the next round. Yeah. Stuart, do you have a... Just one thing, there are other things which you could probably argue go along with yeah. performing money. Yeah, exactly. And if uh, you've looked at things like land value taxation, yeah. or if you have, you should get a view on it. Yeah, I mean, like, personally, I think everyone that works at Positive Money is quite... We're all like supporters of land value tax and kind of citizens income 
um, basic income. But um, we kind of, and we know people that are in the land value tax campaign, but you know, it's already <coughs> quite complicated to talk about money, so we're not going to go veer off. But we're very supportive on a personal level and a kind of um, organisational level of land value tax. Because it's rent seeking stuff again. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's getting less clear in my mind, but that's all right. I mean, uh, my question, not what you're talking about. Yeah. Have you identified a country that is that has an economy as close as what your philosophy, let's say? As close. Have you identified a country in the world that is pretty close or the yeah. clo closest of uh, what you um, wish to promote or what you're promoting? Yeah, no, I don't, haven't done enough research into other mm -hmm. countries, but I mean, Iceland seems pretty... I mean, it's quite small, so it's only half a million people. It's like half of Hackney, or Hackney Borough in London. But they could do it, and I don't see why it wouldn't work. Um, five million, we think, would be a good-sized country. So Denmark, <laughs> Scotland, New Zealand. New Zealand, because it's, like, it's big enough to be taken seriously, but it's also... So, yeah, New Zealand and Denmark are our hopes. But, I'd say, but the, the question was, was it the, the is there a the closed system? Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, system no. Which uses or is something the closest yeah. would be? Oh, close. The yeah. close, let's say, at least would be like Iceland or potentially Iceland. In yeah, the future, but no, yeah. not not very close, I'm afraid. Yeah. We're all in lots of debt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't have yeah, a. We're in historical, <laughs> historical examples of Yeah. Scott? It was just two points from what Ben was talking about and how you sort of marry the sort of money thing into the environment. You maybe heard of Nate Higgins, he's an American guy, and he did a really good uh, YouTube presentation. So I'll try and forward it to you. It's about an hour and a half. <laughs> but he talks about um, if you can create infinite money, fiat currency, if you have a hundred thousand, if you create a hundred thousand pounds, then you're actually asking the ecosystem to match that hundred thousand pounds. The ecosystem isn't finite. So I guess that was his way of looking at it. The other thing I was going to say is. Obviously, the flip side of a recession is that all your green policies go out the window. Yeah. So if they're the first things that get kicked in the touch as soon as you have a recession. Now, people want a house, you know, you, the more important things in the, in the, the environment. And these, these are the four plus, what you came for, wasn't it, Fran? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And actually, that's the one thing that we advocate that we're quite sure on, <laughs> is that the one reason environmentalists shouldn't want the system is because it creates boom and busts and recessions make governments kick out environmental safeguards. Another issue with <coughs> money and the environment, I guess, is that people, a mathematician has calculated that because there is interest on money, it's actually most efficient to fish all the whale out of the sea to extinction as quickly as possible, then have your money in the bank and let it grow with interest rather than fish the whales sustainably. In the end, if you do a cost-benefit uh, analysis, it will be better to just fish, fish the whales to extinction. And that's because of interest on the money. So that's something that would not be addressed in this, in this system, or maybe to some extent. But Part of that is the whole like modern e economics doesn't factor in externalities, does it? So it's the cost of actually depleting your si your system that you, pro you profit from to extinction isn't actually a good idea if you kind of factor that into your economics. But right, I think we'll take uh, just yeah. a couple of last questions. So it, oh no, there are lots of last questions. <laughs> um, uh, okay, people who haven't spoken before, then uh, uh, please uh, so just behind you, Sarah, and then uh, you and at the back row. I think. Okay, three last ones. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So touching on that point you gentlemen made, isn't that the profit aspect of it, doesn't this idea threaten the basis of the profit motive itself? Because right, that's the thing that drives like, increasing financialization and everything else. Right? It's like the, the justification for doing all of this is the pursuit of profit. So I work in the third sector, so I'm clean. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it, it's that desire for profit is it that justifies all of this. Mm -hmm. Not your, our current system, I mean, not what you're proposing. So to start chipping away at that means a fundamental rethink of our entire value system, which is quite frightening for a lot of people, isn't it? Because if you're not doing it in pursuit of profit, 
then where's your motive? Yeah, just to make a quick comment on that, yeah, I, I definitely agree. But I think just kind of on an everyday, pers like, everyday perspective, it's like you don't really begrudge the person that's like working really hard, no, making no. socks to earn a profit, but you do begrudge people that are just kind of re like rent-seeking profit, which yeah. is the kind of finance well, sector. Profit. profit is when you make money without working, right? When you give money to some people and they, make, they work for you, they yeah. make something, you sell it. We could define profit on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, but I'm not sure that the, the cost of money proposal changes that, uh, uh, makes such a fundamental change. No, but that it's the kind of the post growth kind of mindset, isn't it? Of just kind of, you know, the profit motive is what compels us mm -hmm. to do more in most business circles. So if you're. Well, there's the profit is the good side, and there's the avoidance of debt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you, you have a, a pool, yeah. but there's also debt coming up behind you. But if debt is the profit centre itself, if the issuance of debt is the profit centre, mm -hmm. then <coughs> this is the city of London. So, do you have a question that has, has disturbed me for a long time? It's too big a question to expect an answer here, and I don't expect I'd like to leave it. Um, regarding the difference between America in the UK. America is now 17 trillion in debt and the only way they know to get back on the rails allegedly is to increase and increase and increase. And then we have the UK. The only way we can get back on the rails says our Bank of England and our Chancellor. Cut, 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 cut. Now the question, as I say, just chip for later, is either system right, is one of them right, or are they both wrong to get us back on the rails as human beings? But don't answer now, because it's a year all right. No, but, uh, um, I fundamentally disagree there. I think both the American and the UK approach to debt, government debt is exactly the same. The, the go government debt in the UK would be 1.5 trillion pounds by 2015. Although there's a veneer of austerity in Britain, this present government have doubled the national debt. And it's exactly the same approach, really, as the Americans. And that's the futility of the system. Because yeah, when the things that are being cut the here are the essential things in jobs and everything else. That's a political stance. That is a political stance. On the political doesn't come listen. into it. Provided there's no positive money system, I think the Americans have a better idea. Uh, austerity is really hurtful, and that's what actually caused the Great Depression. I mean, the key thing is if you cut jobs, then they go on social security and have take take out benefits. So then you increase your deficit anyway. So it's a bit of a non-productive thing to do. Is there a question in the background? Um, I think yeah. this might be the last one. Yeah. Okay, it was more of a comment. I'm just interested to see if you respond to it. And I'm, I'm not 100% so sure of this. You're talking about potential gains from allying your cause to um, environmentalists. But I would actually put that the other way and say, well, if you look at people in the country, for example, when you poll, a majority of people will, e will either say that they don't believe in man-made climate change or they don't know. And so might you actually do better by emphasizing the other benefits? I mean, I, I like the fact that this has environmental benefits, and I think that's great. And you might get a lot of really keen activists by, by sort of marrying it to an environmental cause. But actually, if you have all the people who don't believe in climate change and all the people who hate windmills on board as well, for other perfectly good reasons to do with how it's going to make their life better, then I don't know that might help. It's just just a thought, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, we're not, I think, you know, everyone's different and we're not going to uh, not try and get on board different types of people. I think at the moment we tend to appeal to people who think more holistically about society and big issues and they are more likely to kind of get active and so they are, you know, quite often, you know, tuned into the climate change import very vital debate. So, but there's, I mean, you know, and I talk to different people, friends or family. I, you know, I don't try and talk about different things. Like house prices is obviously the main one in to people, especially people living in London, young people who have no hope of, of owning a house. But often they aren't necessarily the people that are kind of ready to, that kind of take it on fully and then want to act on it because actually they haven't been thinking oh God, the economy's really broken and it's like looking at the bigger picture. And I think if you have to be, if you've been looking at the bigger picture for a while, then it really helps. Then you're more likely to get motivated 
when you hear about this. So that's this it. is so fundamental, mm. and this is going to be hard enough. Yes, you know, so. This is complicated enough, it's going to be hard enough to change. Let's just do this. Mm. And on that note, I think I'd like to join, like to join me in thanking Fran again for coming. <laughs> <up this. laughs>